the church today? Are you glad to be here? Come on. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord with people who believe what you believe? We're so glad to see everyone here today, everyone joining us online, live on YouTube, Facebook. Drop your location in the comments. We have a team of people there that would love to connect with you. We would love to connect with you. And I just wanna remind you that the King of Kings is on the throne today and He wants to meet with you. We have communion today. We're gonna, we're gonna make an exchange with God. But first, let's turn our hearts, our mind, our attention, our affection to God in worship. Let's worship together.
for friendship Through a flood that made things new again You have proven you are faithful Time after time Time after time Out of Egypt through the wild shown you more than able time after time time after time God of the impossible is with me God of every miracle is for me kingdoms may shake in the mountains Savior in surrender By the marring of a spotless land You have proven that you love us Time after time Through a finished resurrection The psalmist says that 
We know the secret to life that in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of life and at his right hands are pleasures forevermore. It's where real joy exists. And I thank God that the God of the impossible is with us today. We're gonna pause for a moment. We're gonna receive the Lord's Supper, communion. If you don't have the elements, you can raise your hand. Someone will bring those to you. Um, we, we have open communion at Gateway. So all that means is that if you're not a member here, you can take communion with us as long as you're a follower of Jesus. So we'll keep your hand up. Someone will bring that to you. But let's take, a, let's take just a second and do what Jesus said. He said, every time you gather together and every time you break the bread together and have the cup together, remember what I've done. And this, is, this was said on a night where he was about to go to a brutal beating and a punishment for our sins and a cross and, and he was gonna be spat upon and his beard was gonna be ripped out and they were, gonna, they were gonna whip him until his back was open for us. And he said, I want you to remember this because I want you to, I want you to receive what it is over and over and over and over again what I'm doing. And I was studying this this week and the word communion means many things, but one of the things that it means is it means exchange. If you think about it, the same word in communion is found in communication. It's an exchange of information. You talk, I talk, you talk, I talk. We exchange information or maybe in a community where people get together and they share their gifts and they, they share their strengths and, the, and they, they, they compensate for one another, there's an exchange. Well, communion is an exchange as well because the, the Apostle Paul says to examine yourself before you go into communion because you can examine yourself and you can see all of the places where you lack, the places where you are still struggling, the places where you, you have failed. And then you can examine the G, Jesus who, who went to the cross and beat death, hell, and the grave. And you can, you can see that everything you lack can be found in him. Isn't that cool? So, then there's an exchange that can take place at this table. This morning I woke up super early. This is the one year anniversary of the passing of my dad. It was one year ago this day, today when I was holding his hand when he went to eternity and I woke up and I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I was a little sad this morning. So I went and spent some time with the Lord and the Lord said, I wanna make an exchange with you today. I want you to give me your, your grief. I want you to give me your sadness and I wanna give you something. And it's, it's not quite what I thought he was gonna say, but he says, I wanna give you gratitude. And so just for a moment, I was able to tell the Lord all the things I was thankful for about my father. And it really shifted my, my spirit, it shifted my perspective because I made an exchange. You see, the Lord said that in, in, in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that he was gonna be, he was gonna be crushed for our transgressions. He was gonna be bruised or, or, or pierced for our iniquity, our sin. And the, the chastisement or the punishment that would give us peace would be on him. And by his stripes, his scars, his beating and his wounds, we would be healed. That sounds like an exchange to me, right? In Matthew 11, it says, come unto me all who are, who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. That sounds like an exchange to me. So here's the question. We're gonna take this, this, this cracker, which represents the body of Christ that was broken so that you could be put back together. And we're gonna take this cup which resembles the blood of Christ and represents the blood of Christ which was spilled out all the way to the point of water flowing out of his body. He was emptied totally of his life source so that we could be filled with life. So today, what do you need to exchange? Surely there's something you lack today. Surely there's an area where you're still struggling today. Surely there's a brokenness in your life today. And what the Lord says to you today is, would you just remind yourself that I took care of all of that on the cross? And I, was, I, was, I went through all of that so that you could be put back together and so that you could be full. So call to, your, call to the front of your memory today something you need to exchange. And then call to the front of your memory today that Jesus is the answer to that issue in your life. Let's make an exchange today. You guys wanna do that? If you would just open the part that has the, the bread in it, I would even suggest, why don't you just crack it in your fingers so you can feel the breaking of it because it's the breaking of his body that brings the wholeness to ours. Let's thank him for his body today. Thank you, Jesus, that you were broken for our wholeness. We receive that in Jesus' name. Take the bread. You're a good father.
take a moment just to look at that cup. It represents the blood of Jesus. And because he emptied that blood, we can be filled with life. Let's thank him. Father, thank you for pouring out your life so that we could be full of it, full of your life. We take this in remembrance of you. Take the cup. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life so that we could find it. And you were beaten and bruised so we could be forgiven and free. We receive your love today. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's worship him for all the great things he's done for us. Come on, lift up a thank you to Jesus. Can we lift up a thank you? This is our response for the exchange of peace right now. This is our response for the life you have given us. We are grateful right now. Come on, just lift up a thank you in your own way. Just take a moment. Don't, don't rush past this, this moment. Just say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it all, oh, precious.
in this room for every person that you paid the price for personally to bring us close to you to enjoy this moment of being your children to enjoy this moment of intimacy and being loved by the father we thank you for your presence somebody shout in jesus name amen come on one more big thank you for for your father in heaven making you his very own I'm so glad that we can worship together just like this, and I'm so glad that we're free in this church to worship Christ together, amen? Well, there's an amazing message coming, but right now, would you take a moment and just greet some folks around you? Welcome to Gateway Church. Whether you are at a gathering, a campus, or online, we are so glad you are joining us. A lot of great things are happening at Gateway. Here are just a few. To stay connected with all that's going on, visit gatewaypeople.com, follow us on social media, and join your campus Facebook group. If you'd like to give today, you can do that through our website, our mobile app, or one of our offering envelopes at any of our campuses. There are so many opportunities to grow, connect, and be encouraged. To learn more, stop by Connect Central, text CONNECT to 71010, or visit gatewaypeople.com. We're so glad you've joined us. Thanks for being here today. To me, conference is just about learning how to have fun and embrace God and His love for you in a fun environment. I feel like He's just calling us higher to want Him, and, and conference is one of those ways to get hungry. Ever since conference, I really feel that God has found ways to implement Himself into my life in like all aspects. Since Gateway Students Conference, I have had a lot more friends, and I really think it changed the way that I view the Lord and what church really is about. time you just see a different part of God that you haven't seen before and it just shines a light on students and on this generation that no other place can. Jesus all throughout scripture is the torch of light. He is the fire. He's in the burning bush. He's the fire that guides the Israelites by day. He was there in the Old Testament. He was there in the covenant that was made with Abraham. In the same way, we worship Yeshua as our Messiah. We are to be in covenant with the Jewish people. And we are to pray for the protection of Israel and the protection of Jewish people and the realization that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Hey everyone, welcome to Gateway Church. I'm so excited to be able to continue on in this series. Let me first mention something that you just saw a little bit about, which is the Students Conference. It starts this week. It is amazing. Both of my kids uh, attend students at their campus and, uh, and are looking forward to the Students Conference. So it's going to be great. If you have kids of that age, this will be a perfect thing for you to take them to. So we'd love to see your students at the conference. Information is on the screen about how um, you can get involved with that. Let me uh, also update you on something that took place this week. Um, we, we have a great communications team made up of a bunch of people that do an incredible job. I work with them a lot on a, a daily and weekly basis on different items and projects. And then I work with them especially closely on the descriptions and the images and things like that that you'll see during the series that I preach. So this uh, design that you see, Jesus BC, as well as every other series that I've ever preached, the here, the uh, design graphics have been done by one person. Her name is Christy Canetta. I think we have a picture of her here. 
Um, this week on Monday, she was in a really bad car accident. Um, it broke her pelvis, pelvis and her sacrum and uh, banged her up pretty badly. And uh, I'll show you a picture of the car. Um, she was, that's the driver's side of the car and she was T-boned by a truck. And uh, so I've been praying for her as well as the staff for this week. She's doing well, she's recovering. They're debating about whether she's gonna need surgery or not. Uh, she took a couple steps uh, a couple days ago, which is great. We're, we're really excited for her on that. Um, so Christy, I'm continuing to pray for you, but now you have all of these people praying for you as well. So we're praying for a speedy recovery. <laughs> Last week, we, we talked about the covenant with Abraham, and we talked about how the covenant with the Jewish people is tied to the covenant, the new covenant that we are a part of as Gentiles. Um, and so... That was the topic that we were talking about. I've told you about the book, Who Ate Lunch with Abraham. If you tried to grab it and it was sold out, I'm sorry, the demand was much higher than we expected. You can get it on Amazon, but we're also working to restock, and there may even be some there in the bookstores at each of your campuses today. But I got a chance to talk to the author. I did a Zoom call with him, and I was talking about this series and his book and asking him some questions, and he said that... Uh, there's three things that need to happen for Jesus to, to come back. One is that the gospel needs to go to all the nations, which is something that we probably most often focus on. Number two is something that we don't think about very often, which is that the bride needs to be ready for the bridegroom to show up. And number three is that the gospel of the Messiah must be taken to God's original family, the Jewish people. Satan does not want that to happen. And when we stood as a church last week, I know it wasn't very much of a personal ministry moment, but what we were doing is we were all standing and saying, as a church, Gateway Church, we will continue to love the Jewish people, to love Israel, and to continue to pursue them in telling them about their Messiah. What Asher told me whenever I talked to him on the, on the Zoom call is he said, if you do this, if you go through with this, watch out. The spiritual warfare and the resistance that the enemy has to the Jewish people recognizing Jesus as their Messiah. I'll tell you why in week number four, but the resistance that Satan has to the Jewish people recognizing Jesus as the Messiah is so strong. And so he said, watch out. I don't know, I, like life circumstances happen, obviously, but as soon as I heard about Christy, and her integral work in this series, I thought we as a church need to take up our spiritual warfare and our prayer to a whole new level as we continue to reach out to Jewish people, to pray for them and to bless the nation of Israel. So I wanna ask you to do that with me, to continue to pray over the staff, the volunteers, the people of this congregation. Spiritual warfare is rising, but we will not back down. God, I believe, saved Christie's life. It, it could have been so much worse. And so I want us to remember that as we do this, this is the mandate we have from Jesus, and this is what we will continue to do. The spiritual warfare will be intense, but God saved Christie's life. And I ask you and beg of you, please continue to pray for this church, the staff, the congregation, the people, because as we step further and further into this, the resistance is gonna be great. So if you'll do that with me, we will continue to pray for protection over this place. So we are in a series called Jesus BC. I uh, kind of held the, the, the idea of that until the end of the message last week, and that is obviously Jesus before Christ. And that doesn't make very much sense, but as we're seeing, Jesus was actually there involved. He was present in the Old Testament much more than maybe we have previously thought or anticipated. So we're gonna continue on in that this week. I do need to make one other comment to you. Last week, I talked about my fear uh, that I've never heard of an old Josh. So I thought maybe we had an expiration date. Maybe all Joshes die young. I'm not sure. I've already made it past Jesus's age, and his name is a derivative of the name Joshua. So I'm feeling kind of good about that, you know. And then I got like a million messages from you all, all pointing out that you found an old Josh, all right? I'm not trying to call him out. It's Josh McDowell, though. I'll just say it, all right? 
um, but I won't actually say his age because this is what I was trying to avoid. You did this to me. You all emailed me about Josh McDowell. I won't actually say his age. He's 82 years old. But if, anyways, <laughs> you, let, this is the thing is though, you actually proved my point. Good for you. You found one old Josh in the world. Not one person sent me a name other than Josh McDowell. So way to go. You found one old Josh. He beat the odds and we're all really proud of him. Way to go. He will never see this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, that's great. So keep sending me old Josh's if you can find them. Challenge accepted. But uh, so far, you guys are not doing so great. You found one, all right? So I believe that this person that we looked at in the Old Testament who ate lunch with Abraham, who talked with him, who was described as a man, yet also described as God, I believe this was Jesus. You could describe him as a son of man and yet still be the son of God. This perfectly describes Jesus. And today, the, the instances that we're gonna see in the Bible, uh, he shows up in a different form, a, a little bit of a different form than how he had ever shown up in, in the story of Abraham. So first, I just wanna cover something that we talked about last week. I'll do it really briefly, but we start in John chapter one in verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God. But the unique one, that's Jesus, who is himself God, he's part of the Trinity, he is God himself, but he is God the Son, not God the Father, is near to the Father's heart, and he has revealed God to us. So when the scripture says no one has ever seen God, what they're saying is no one has ever seen the full manifest glory of the ancient of days, the one who is God the Father. No one has ever seen them, but in, in order to make God accessible to us, Jesus removes the glory that is placed on him by becoming a man, coming to the earth, being born through a woman and living as a man, and it made him incredibly approachable. We'll see that in, in the story of the Exodus today that, that in times where God's glory or Jesus's glory is showing through, men and women are not able to approach him or to see his face. Otherwise, the glory would devour us and we wouldn't be able to live through it. In John chapter five, verse 37, this is Jesus speaking. He says, and the father who sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe me, the one he sent to you. This part is really important because he says, no one has ever heard his voice or seen him face to face. Yet in, in the, the story of the Exodus, Moses on Mount Sinai, it says very specifically that he spoke to God face to face. What this means is that as Jesus is saying, you've never seen God the Father face to face, it does not negate that we have seen Jesus face to face. Moses did on Mount Sinai. They spoke face to face, whether he could actually visualize his face or not. Maybe it was covered up with the light that shines from Jesus's face, but, but he had a face to face encounter with him. That means it could only be Jesus because that would not have been possible with God the Father. So Jesus is the one who spoke to Moses there uh, on that day. So Jesus is God. He's a member of the Trinity. The best way to think about that is uh, the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three individual persons, but they are one. The best way to describe the way that they function is in the form of a divine dance. If you've ever seen two dance partners that are very in tune and in sync with each other, they move as if they are one person because every stride and every step is in balance or cadence with each other. So they move as if they are one, but they are two distinct people who have two distinct jobs or roles within that dance. That's the best way to think about this trinity, this trifecta of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three individual persons, each having their own role in the lives of the earth and the people on the earth, but yet at the same time, they are one. Jesus, or God, is so 
powerful in all of his glory that the Bible describes to us over and over again that if you were to see him or be in his presence, you would be burned away because of the sin in our lives. So what was needed for us to be able to make contact with God was a mediator. That's what the Bible describes Jesus as, as the mediator over and over. The passage we just read says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. If we want to see God, we see God through Jesus. And in fact, the opposite is true. If God looks at us, he looks at us through the lens of Jesus because that is where we obtain our righteousness is through Jesus. So Jesus came in a non-glorified body as a man laying down his divinity as he stepped into the earth. And we talked about that in the humanity series. And he did that so that mankind could approach him and know him without being devoured by his glory. Since we'll be talking about the Exodus story, we'll see lots of examples where they have to hide, where there's thunder, lightning, clouds on the mountain. He has to hide his face from them. The, this, this happens because he's in a glorified form. Becoming a man, laying down his divinity, allowed him to be accessible in a way that he had never been before. So the general idea is in the Old Testament that if he appears as a man, uh, like he did to Abraham, then he is actually in the Holy Land. He is in the, the Holy Land and he appears as a man. General rule, if he appears as some other object or, or an angel or something like that in a glorified form, then he is outside of the Holy Land. And so when we see these experiences, as we will see on Mount Sinai, this is in a glorified form. Still the same person that we were talking about last week, but now in a glorified form. So before we get to the Exodus, I just want to throw in just one interesting thing. I'm seeing Jesus now in every part of the Old Testament. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to read with eyes that show Jesus in every single facet or aspect. And we talked a lot about how uh, the Jewish belief is that God the Father has no form. He is shapeless and formless. Uh, he's the spiritual being, the ancient of all days that has always existed and, he, and so the form, a physical form, we would not be able to see. So whenever we see Jesus in a human form, he is the mediator. He has taken on the form that we would recognize and relate to. And as he does that, then we know that when we see him in the form of a human, that most likely this is Jesus that we're talking about. That got me interested in the creation story where we see that Adam and Eve are walking in the garden with God. And God in the Old Testament here is, is many different names throughout the Hebrew Old Testament. But uh, what we see there then is that they're walking in the garden with God. This means they were walking with him, talking with him, communicating with him. So I got to wondering, could this actually be Jesus that, that Adam and Eve were walking with in the garden? And what did Jesus's role look like in creation itself? How was the world created? Well, when we look at Genesis, we know that it was created, as anybody will tell you, it was created with what? The spoken word. It was the word that God spoke everything into existence. Then we look at John, the book of John. It starts with, right at the very beginning, it says, in the beginning. Well, there's another passage in the Bible that starts with in the beginning, and that's in Genesis. Genesis 1, when it describes creation, starts with in the beginning. John is making a reference back to creation and saying in the beginning. So he's describing creation. He's making this reference. Everyone would recognize this as a reference to Genesis 1. And let's see what he says about Jesus's role in creation. This has been here right in front of us all along, yet we have failed to see it through the, the proper eyes that would show Jesus to us. So John chapter one, starting in verse one says, in the beginning, the word already existed. Word is capitalized here. It's not talking about your Bible, all right? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the logos, the word, the spoken word of God. Jesus is the word made manifest to us. So he's describing, John is describing, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Through Jesus, all of creation was created. And nothing was created 
except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. I believe it was Jesus who was the spoken word of God that created the earth. I believe it was Jesus who was walking in the cool of the garden, uh, the cool of the evening in the garden with Adam and Eve. It was Jesus who was there. And this passage alone would be enough for me, but look at what Colossians chapter one, verse 15 says. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. We just read that part just a moment ago. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him, and for him, he existed before anything else and he holds all of creation together. Christ is the one who through the power of God creates the world and partners with mankind and he even adds mankind to the deed for the earth and he says, I wanna run this place with you and yet Adam and Eve then, then give that deed over to Satan through the fall and the story of Jesus continuing to show up working through his family, the Israelites, is so that he can take back what mankind lost in the fall. So Jesus keeps showing up, partnering with mankind again. He partners with Abraham and David and Noah and, and Jonah and all of these people to begin to bring his order back into the world. And he's trying to undo what was done at the fall. And all the appearances of Jesus that we look at in this series are the times where Jesus is breaking back into the world that he was expelled from and working to partner with mankind again to create an avenue for him to restore creation to what he originally intended. And so now we come to the part where he made a covenant with Abraham. He was multiplying the Israelites and they were growing into a mighty nation. So Satan decides to put them under the control of a maniacal leader named Pharaoh who oppressed them. And now Jesus needs to partner with mankind again to free the Israelites so he can get them to the land that he has promised them. So it was Jesus who met with Moses and told him how to deal with Pharaoh. It was Jesus who gave him the power to confront Pharaoh and the miracles of Jesus caused the plagues to happen on the Egyptians that were holding them as slaves. And it was Jesus who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Moses, I don't know if you know this, but he didn't speak to a burning bush. It says really clearly that he spoke to God himself. In fact, let me, let me just show you something here in Exodus chapter three, verse two. It says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Okay, so it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him. You might say, well, this is just an angel sent by the Lord, and, 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 and that would make sense. It says the angel of the Lord, that would make sense. It, it, the actual Hebrew word here is angel Yehovah. So the angel Yehovah appeared there in that. If, a, if any translation actually describes him as the angel Yehovah, whenever they translate it, they'll say the angel of the Lord. That will make you sound like it's an angel that comes from the Lord. The actual word here is two words put together, angel Yehovah. Yehovah means God and this is in angel form. What it's describing here is a mixture between something that looks like an angel, but who is God. It's, it's sort of, the, in Hebrew, it's the mixing of two words, uh, the way that we, we have the word foot and we have the word stool, put those together, it's footstool, it becomes its own meaning right there. Angel Yehovah means in angelic form, God is showing up. And we know that it's God because if we just go two verses down to verse four, it says, when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, this is God 
in the midst of the burning bush. He's not speaking to a burning bush. It is God in the midst of the burning bush. And so this is always how Jesus is described in the Old Testament when he shows up in a glorified form. It's the angel Yehovah. But he speaks as God. He's worshiped as God. He's acknowledged as God. And he even says here in this encounter with Moses, this is where he says, I am that I am. He's describing himself as God. And he says, say this to the people of Israel. I am the God of your ancestors. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if this is Jesus as angel Jehovah, he's clearly stating, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just as his references are in the New Testament that we looked at last week, where he refers back to being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, even in the New Testament, I am that I am. He's claiming to be God, but he is also inferring that he was there. And so in Genesis, he's called a man because he shows up to Abraham in the form of a man. But here in Exodus, he's referred to as the angel Jehovah because he's showing up in this glorified form. Now, here's an instance where uh, the the people are gonna go up on the mount, on Mount Sinai, and they're gonna have an encounter with God. And I love this encounter so much. It's Exodus chapter 24, verses nine through 11. It says, Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. 74 people go up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel under his feet. He had feet, so he was in human, in some form of human form. And there under his feet seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli. That means sapphire stone, basically, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. This is classic Jesus classic Jesus. Here they, they climb up to the top of the mountain and they meet with God. And what does he do? He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Let me serve you a meal. What does Jesus do all throughout the New Testament? He eats with prostitutes, tax collectors, the way that he institutes the new covenant that we as Gentiles have entered into is through a meal, the Last Supper, the celebration of the Passover meal. That is the way that he institutes the new covenant and gives us a sign. At every campus today, We received communion. When we receive communion, we remember that it was through that meal that he established his covenant with us. This is Jesus establishing a covenant. And how does he do it? In the same way that he's always done it before with a meal. Even after his resurrection, he continued to do that because on the road to Amazus, he meets two people who he ends up walking with. They end up sharing a meal. And the Bible says that it's in the breaking of the bread that they realize that he is Jesus. I don't know if they had that same realization on that day that in the, in the moment of eating the meal, they didn't know who Yeshua was. They didn't know that he would be the Messiah who would save the world. So that part of him was hidden from them, but there he sits and he eats a meal with them in classic Jesus style. This is Jesus who shares this meal with him. And, and so uh, when he is in this uh, glorified form, we can't see his face. It, it's common that when Jesus is presenting himself in all of his glory, we wouldn't be able to see his face. We remember that Moses so badly wanted him to turn his face towards him so he could see it. That's when God put him like in the crevice of a rock. And he said, I'm gonna pass by. Sometimes when you read stories like that, it's like the weirdest stuff. Like I like it when uh, Jesus uh, says to Abraham, hey, why did Sarah laugh in the tent? And uh, I think like from the tent, maybe Sarah's like, I didn't laugh. And he goes, oh yes, she did. She did laugh. He's like arguing with Abraham. This is one of those weird things where Moses is like, please, can I see your face? And he's like, I don't know, dude, dude, just get in that rock right there. I'll pass by and I'll kind of look back and you can get a little glimpse. Is that, will that work, you know? It's like always these ways that we negotiate with God. And this is Jesus revealing that he can't show his entire glory. His face is glowing with brilliant white light in this instance. And even when Moses comes off the mountain, after getting that little glimpse of Jesus, it said that his face was glowing, just shining and radiant 
radiating light. That is the power of Jesus' full glory that the light would overwhelm us and overtake us. And that is why my favorite prayer, if you know, if I've ever ended a service in, in this congregation, you know that the very last thing that I do is pray the ironic blessing over you. And, and, and it's such an important prayer to me. But thinking about how you cannot see God's face, the brightness, the glory would consume you and kill you. You would not be able to handle it. Now, let me read what the ironic blessing is to you and see if it stands out to you in a different way than normal. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai, God, Lord, make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May Adonai, the Lord, turn his face towards you and grant you peace. When we have been purified through the redemption that Christ offers us through the death and resurrection of the cross, we get the profound opportunity. It must have been unbelievable for Moses to bargain with God over and over just to get a glimpse of his face. And when we have been made righteous through his blood, Adonai himself turns his face toward us. Is there any better blessing than that? For all we talk about, uh, hashtag blessed, you know, I got a new car this week or whatever. How much better would it be if God himself allowed you to see his face? That is the ultimate blessing and the ultimate thing that Moses desired as he stood there on Mount Sinai. This gives a, a, a whole new meaning to God shining his face on you. Now, remember on Mount Sinai, that is also where it says that the Ten Commandments were created and that God himself, that the very hand of God carved the Ten Commandments on the stone. Well, that's always been great and interesting. All right, so cool. They were up there, God showed up, he wrote the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, Moses comes down and he's like, guys, you broke all of these already. And he smashes them and he breaks them. He's like, you're doing a terrible job. I can't handle this. He wants to quit. And God, God writes it again. He says, make two tablets of stone. And the very hand of God himself writes the Ten Commandments and he gives the law to the people. All right, this knowing that it was Jesus. Again, we're talking about a, a human attribute. The hand of God carves this into the stone. This is the angel Jehovah. It is the angel of, of Jehovah that shows up and, and writes the 10 commandments into the stone. Jesus's hand, okay? In John chapter eight, people come to Jesus and they go, we caught this woman in adultery. The author and originator of the law is now trying to decide what to do. He takes his hand and he bends down and he writes something yet again. I don't know what he wrote. I don't know what it said, but it absolutely changed the hearts of every person who was standing there ready to absolutely punish this woman for the adultery that she was caught in. The lawgiver himself takes his hand yet again and writes something and it changes the course of this woman's life and his response is, go and sin no more. No one here condemns you, but go and sin no more. His response is so gracious and loving. He says, don't, don't do this anymore. So what he's really saying is, to you, the Pharisees, don't condemn and to you, the woman caught in adultery, don't sin. Don't condemn, don't sin. That's what he says. If we live in a, a, a world or a version of Christianity where uh, we, we, we take the gospel of forgiveness way too far, remove all absolute moral standards, then we end with, I don't condemn you, go and sin all you want. But if instead we take the moral standards without forgiveness, then we, we get to a pharisaical level of saying, you've sinned, you're condemned. That's what they were doing to the woman caught in adultery. Yet forgiveness without moral law leads to humanism and crime, and moral law without forgiveness leads to rel religiosity and condemnation. Jesus, don't condemn, don't sin. Grace, forgiveness, and justice 
all wrapped up in one. You ever wonder about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he's on the Mount of Beatitudes there and he's talking uh, about, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say don't even lust. This seems in stark contradiction to what he just said to the woman caught in adultery, except that he was telling her not to sin, to go and sin no more. On the Mount of Beatitudes, he says, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I say don't even let angerness build, build up in your heart. And I always thought it was a little bit strange that it seemed as if he was refuting everything that God the Father laid out in the Old Testament. If I wrote a book and I published that book, there is only one person who could go back and make editorial changes that are properly approved to the book that I have written, and that is the author himself. Jesus, the author of the law in the first place, shows back up and says, you've heard it said this, but here's how I'm modifying it. And it makes perfect sense because this is how we raise our children every single day. When they're young, we just say, don't run in the street. As they get older, we start to explain, this is why. My dad has an incredible sermon series about how the Ten Commandments are really about relationships and not about rules. This is what Jesus was communicating on the Mount of Beatitudes. And all of that is summed up that on the Mount Sinai, he gives the law. On the Mount of Beatitudes, he refines the law. And on the Mount of Golgotha, he dies and fulfills the law and gives us grace for everyone. This is the completion of Jesus's work from the beginning of time to the end of time. It was Jesus all along. So this is the way that Jesus works with this duality here where he says, of course, don't sin, but there is forgiveness within this, uh, within this, this law. So the moral law comes from Yeshua on Mount Sinai. His finger wrote the Ten Commandments, and on the Mount of Beatitudes, he explains the heart and the meaning of the Torah. And on Mount Calvary, he died to forgive us of our transgressions of that law. On the Mount of Olives, he will return to punish those who refuse that forgiveness and that obedience. This is the work that Jesus has been doing from the beginning of time. Now, here's one more really important story that I want to point out in the the story of the Exodus. Uh, You might remember that Moses didn't actually get to make it to the promised land. Moses died on Mount Nebo, and whenever I took a trip to Jordan, uh, Pastor Nick Lesmeister and his wife Tabitha, that were that Nick prayed the prayer over the Jewish people last weekend, they were the ones leading that trip to Jordan, and so we went to Mount Nebo, and uh, and and we're there, there at Mount Nebo, and I'm thinking through why we've we've seen the crazy terrain of the places that the Israelites traveled. We've seen the difficulty of their, their, their wandering through the wilderness. And, and, and Moses did did so much in the faith. Why doesn't Moses then get to go into the promised land? And the Bible says that it's because uh, instead of speaking to the rock to, to get water to come out, he strikes the rock with the rod and water still comes out. But because of that, After everything that he's done, every mistake that he's made, every single thing that he's done, he doesn't get to go into the promised land because of that. Now, I did a series um, called Promised Land where I talked extensively about all the imagery in the story of the Exodus that points to Jesus. This is talking about the actual instances of Jesus's appearance to the Israelites in the Exodus. But uh, here, what we're looking at then is that, that Moses was first, what he did by striking the rock was something that he had already done before. The first time God told him, take the rod, strike the rock, and water will come forth. Anytime in the story of the, the, the Exodus, you see the rod that's made of wood that represents the cross. Anytime you see the rock, Jesus is described over and over in the Bible as a rock. He is the rock. So Jesus is the rock. The cross struck Jesus and life-giving water came out of it. This is a symbol for what he was later going to do many years later through his death and resurrection. So the first time Moses was told, take the rod, strike the rock and water will come forth. The next time he was supposed to speak to the rock. Moses, this wasn't as much of a punishment as I think we like to make it out to be. The, the, The stance that Jesus was taking here is that Jesus was struck once and once only for all of our transgressions, and he will not be struck again. 
seems like a minor innocent mistake. God worked this way last time. We'll just make him work this way again. What God is saying here is Jesus was struck once for all of our transgressions, but he will not be struck again. And if you're worried about Moses and him dying and not being able to make it into the promised land, uh, I want to tell you a little something about this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, starting in verse 5. It says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day, no one knows the exact place. To this day, no one knows the exact place. So I'm with a group of people, great people from the church, and we get to Mount Nebo, and it's this beautiful place. It stands very high, and you can see everything. And, and God gave Moses this supernatural vision to see all the land, all the land that they had been through and all the land that the Israelites were gonna go into from that very spot. He's standing on this very high place. And so we get there and we're standing there and it's an incredible experience standing on Mount Nebo and knowing that this is the spot where Moses died. And Nick is leading us and uh, I don't know, I don't know what I ever thought about this scripture. Honestly, I think I had passed over it so quickly, so many times that I'd never really thought about it. And there Nick is explaining it to us. And he says, uh, imagine the care that God had for Moses. That when Moses died, he comes down like a friend or someone who loves this person so much he bends down and he scoops up his friend. He picks him up and he carries him off to this place where he'll never be disturbed. I started realizing maybe in the past, whenever I've thought about this story, I just assumed God miraculously picked up all the dirt particles and the rocks and moved them out of the way and the body magically slides into the grave and dirt just piles back over him. No, Jesus himself comes down to the earth. He scoops up his friend. He carries him off to a place where no one will ever find him. He does the painstaking work of digging over and over and over again so that carefully he can place his friend down in that grave and lay his body to rest. And so we're standing there on the top of this mountain and everyone had kind of gone off to see different things. And I'm standing there at the place where based on the description of, of, of this in the Bible, where they believe Jesus or God may have taken Moses to go and bury him. And so I'm standing at the edge of this rail and I'm looking down on this beautiful valley and something that happened to me that has never happened to me before in my life. I, I have seen things in my mind that I'm tempted to attribute to a vision from God that may be prophetic or a sign of warning or something like that. But I've never had anything like this before happen. I'm standing at the edge of the rail. And I'm looking down and through the trees, I see this Bedouin looking man holding a dead man. Gray hair, long beard, head tilted back, no life in him at all. And I could see so clearly this man taking each step down this rocky hill and moving down towards the place where he was taking him. And they came into my vision as they passed through one tree, walked through this open spot, went behind another tree, and I never saw anything again. And it was as real as anything I've ever seen in my life. I could see the person there. It was in that moment that I realized we need to see Jesus in the Old Testament. 
Maybe you've thought, well, there was God the Father, this angry, harsh, judgmental God who turns people to salt in the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes along and it's like he's this weird other version of God all about grace and, 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 and forgiveness. It is Jesus all the way through. The Jesus who wants to redeem everything in the world comes down to the earth with a sword of fire and flames to set everything right. It is also Jesus who even when we mess up and we don't get to the place where we want to be, he comes down himself and he scoops us up. And with such meticulous care, he loves us. He lays you down to rest. We might look at it and say what Moses did shouldn't be the cardinal sin that doesn't allow him to go to the promised land. But what I see when I see Jesus himself burying Moses is that no matter how far gone we are and no matter what we do, Jesus cares deeply and passionately for us. He meets us in that moment. His character is still the same today. He says, there is no condemnation with me. Now go and sin no more. This is the grace of Jesus. It is consistent from the beginning to the end. His love for you is never exhausted. It never runs out and it never ends. What I felt when I was praying for today is that some people will walk here and in here and say, I've been beating myself up over and over for the things that I've done. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And if that's you, or maybe you just need prayer for a different area of your life. You need help in an area of finding a job or finances or health or any of those things. It says where two or three are gathered together, God is in their midst. But specifically, there will be people here tonight who cannot stop beating themselves up over what they've done. And through the power of prayer, I believe what you'll hear tonight is, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Grace and truth mixed with power and love. This is the Jesus that has existed throughout all of creation and the one that wants to meet you here tonight. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? In just a moment, we're gonna have a time of prayer at the altar at every campus. And whatever your need is, don't miss the opportunity to pray with someone today. Lord, when I was praying before the service, I just felt like you asked me to pray for gratitude. Lord, I was just back there earlier. I was thanking you for countless things over and over. Lord, we have so much to be grateful for. And chief among all of those things is that you are so gracious to us. So Lord, I pray that your grace, like a wind rushing over this room, would overtake us. Lord, there's been people that are here tonight that are afraid to go up on that mountain and meet with you face to face. We know it's sin that holds us back, but God, you sent Jesus to be the ultimate mediator and so now, no matter what we've done, we can come boldly to you. 
we will hear your precious words say, there is therefore now no condemnation. We are so grateful for the grace that you have extended to us over and over and over again. And Lord, I pray that every person who needs prayer, that God, the work of the enemy would not stop them from having an encounter with you today. And Lord, may we recognize that it is you in our presence and in our midst today. So Lord, give us strength and wisdom and power. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We're going to stand together. And when we do, our altar ministry team is going to come forward. And before you leave today, just ask yourself, how do I need to respond to that? How do I need to respond to a God who is, who is here for me, who, is, who longs for a relationship with me, who wants to care for me and guide me and heal me? And today, our altar ministry team will pray with you for any reason that you, that you have. We will stay as long as you need. And if you're online, uh, our pastors in the chat will pray with you. And also, you can text the word prayer to 71010. Someone will pray with you there. We don't want you to leave today or disconnect today before you connect with God and with each other. At Gateway, we want people to connect with God, with Gateway and the resources, and to one another. We're here for each other, so you can come as long as, we'll stay as long as you need. You can come for any reason. Take advantage of that today. A couple of things that I need to tell you before you leave. Number one, student conferences this week, and if you haven't signed up, we still have a few spaces available. If you're here in this service, you can walk out of these doors. There's a booth where you can actually sign up. If you're online or you wanna go home and, and consider it for your teenager, just go to the website, you can register there. In two weeks, we have baptisms, which is amazing here at every campus. And also, um, you, can, you, can, you can register for that and also you can just come and show up. But we would love for you to register so we can prepare properly. It's really cool. We have like a swimming pool in the lobby and you know nobody's doing cannonballs or anything, but it's really festive and fun. We love to celebrate baptism and following Jesus. Maybe you realize that you haven't been baptized since you were saved. A lot of people get baptized really early and then they come, they come to the realization that was actually before their salvation. We would love to make that right for you and help you in your faith journey and baptize you. And also at Gateway, we love to connect with, each, with you and with each other. So right outside of these doors is Connect Central. Stop by, say hello. We'd love to meet you. And if you're online, you can text connect to 71010 or visit our website, connect though, because we wanna be connected to one another. We're, there's strength in numbers and we're here for each other. All right, let me pray a blessing over you today. And then let's go in peace and take this good news to the world. Father, thank you for everyone that has come to this room today and everyone who's connected online. Nobody has connected by accident. Every single one of us needed that word today and every single one of us are responsible to now carry that out into our world. I pray healing and deliverance. I pray God restoration in families and, and, and that you would heal broken marriages. I pray that lost children would come home and that every single one of us would go into our world and we would be a light in the darkness and many, many people would come to know Jesus because of what, how we live our lives and the testimony that we live. Bless your people today. Bless the people of Gateway Church today to be a blessing to the world. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.